Hi everyone. I've had to take a much longer break than I expected to. As some of you know, I've been in what I called COVID hell, in which I wasn't able to do very much except lie in bed and in between sleeping I did angry tweeting and squabbling on Twitter. Obviously that's not something that takes much uh, energy or brain power, um, but I was suffering from fatigue for quite a long time afterwards. It's unfortunate that my illness coincided with Kelly J. Keane's tour of Australia and New Zealand. I had a particularly strong reaction to the sight of a woman aged 70 plus getting her face broken by a young man. I will show the footage of the assault that caused her two fractures at the end of the video, but in case you don't make it that far, please note that I link to a fundraiser that has been started for her below this video. Seeing what happened in Australia and New Zealand has shifted my thinking a bit, and I'm not sure at the moment whether that's a temporary reaction or a permanent one, but one thing that will be permanent is this. I am not one who frequently used the term trans rights activists or TRAs, though I often used trans activists. Now, when I use the term trans activist, I'm talking about anybody who promotes transgender ideology, whether they describe themselves as transgender or queer, non-binary, trans ally, whatever. Not anymore. It's time to stop framing this horrendous war of attrition as being about so-called trans rights. Why are we opposed to gender ideology? What drew us into this conflict? Well, in my case, the primary reason was because it hurts women. I now know that it hurts more than just women. It hurts some men and children of both sexes, but it was primarily about women's rights to single sex spaces and sports for me. And given that those who try to drown out our voices everywhere we go by shouting trans rights are human rights without even being able to say what they mean by that, from now on, I'm calling them anti-women's rights activists or just anti-women activists, anti-women and children activists, whatever, as long as the focus is on, on what they are against and not on their pretense of being some kind of human rights movement. By the way, before I went down with COVID, I was working on several videos, all of which I intend to continue with, but at the moment, I can't get my mind off of what happened in Australia and New Zealand. I'm reminded of a feeling I had a few times when I was a young adult, when I was suddenly and unexpectedly bereaved. This happened to me three times within two years in the 1980s. Three people I knew, two were relatives, each of them young, fit, happy and loved, had everything to live for. Each of them died in accidents and I couldn't accept it initially because it wasn't fair. And the first question that came to mind each time was why? And I didn't mean what was the cause of the accident in each case. Ultimately, it was a pointless question, a meaningless question to which there is no answer except shit happens. And I've been experiencing a similar sense of shock and bewilderment about the way Kelly J has been treated by firstly, the media in Australia and New Zealand. I still can't quite believe the nonsense they wrote about her. Secondly, by certain politicians in those countries. And thirdly, by the anti-women activists themselves, both those who went to protest women's rights at her gigs and online ever since. And again, I'm asking why, but this time it's not a pointless or a meaningless question. The point is trying to understand what the hell do they think they have achieved? How does it help what they presumably think of as the cause of 
trans rights, by the way, just in case anyone has landed here and who doesn't know who Kelly J. Keene, aka Posey Parker is, please just Google her. All I'm going to say at this point is that she is possibly the bravest and mentally strongest person I know. She won't be defeated by the gender terrorists. Now, there are a few things I want to say, and I've made some notes. So the first thing is about the word Nazi. I've said something about this before. Here's the clip. I know it's been said by others many times, but this fashion, this penchant nowadays for flinging out the word Nazi at people you disagree with is an insult. It disrespects everyone who suffered under the Third Reich, and that includes both my parents and their families especially my mother's family, who from a country that was occupied by the Nazis, and as someone who was born in the post-war period, I grew up knowing from the earliest age of the suffering that had been endured by so many of my parents' generation and their parents. That is something this bully and his acolytes are not capable of understanding because if they did they surely wouldn't behave as they do their conscience wouldn't allow it so to remind you the word nazi referred to a party devoted to extreme german nationalism aryan supremacy and anti-semitism which became a mass movement under the leadership of Adolf Hitler, who came to power in Germany in 1933. Again, I've covered some of what the Nazis did in a previous video, so sorry to repeat myself, but among the many terrible things they did was murder even pure-blooded Germans if they were not deemed to be perfect specimens, people with incurable illnesses, physical and mental disabilities, even just elderly if they were judged to be burdensome and their lives not worth living. An estimated 200,000 people lost their lives under the euthanasia program T4, it was called. I studied all this stuff at college and some things I haven't forgotten. Homosexual men, I believe about 100,000 were arrested, about half imprisoned and up to 15,000 interned in concentration camps where they were tortured as guinea pigs in medical experiments. These included cross-dressers or men who would nowadays probably call themselves trans women. I haven't been able to find out so far if heterosexual men who presented as women were included in these statistics, perhaps because they were perceived to be gay and therefore abnormal, or whether they were just seen as mentally ill and murdered under the euthanasia program. The Slavs and other people in Poland, Eastern Europe, and the Soviet Union were seen as inferior beings used as forced labour. Nearly two million in Poland alone were murdered. These were white Gentiles. I mention this because it's not quite true to say the Nazis were white supremacists. They were Aryan supremacists and those they considered Aryans were Germanic, Anglo-Saxon and Nordic peoples, not Slavs. European gypsies were considered subhuman and were targeted for total destruction. It's impossible to be too precise about how many were murdered, but a quarter of a million is unlikely to be far off the mark. And I can't even bear to talk about what the Nazis did to the women they performed medical experiments on, but I will link to a good article by Jen Isaacson below. And, of course six million Jews. That is what the Nazis did and the gender cult are calling women who don't want men in our spaces Nazis. Shameful. This is Cassie O'Connor, a green politician in Tasmania. The turfs who spewed hate and goose-stepped 
are ideologically aligned with the murderers of six million innocent. Oh, God. The turfs, of course, neither spewed hate nor goose-stepped. But when did a politician ever let the truth get in the way of what they think benefits them personally? To me, a Nazi is the worst thing you can be. And anyone who calls someone a Nazi or a Nazi sympathiser when they aren't one, anyone who tosses it out like it's no worse than calling someone an arsehole or a numpty, is the lowest of the low, beneath contempt. I wouldn't even scrape you off the sole of my shoe. I'd sooner throw away the whole effing shoe than have any remnant of your worthless, repugnant person anywhere near me. And I'm talking about this woman and this man and this man and this man and countless others. Now, seeing as how the Nazis were guilty of every crime of brutality invented by mankind and with the original Nazis having been defeated historically, I cannot begin to understand why any of their ideas live on, but they do in the form of neo-Nazism, which is alive and well in different countries. And a bunch of its proponents apparently live in or around Melbourne. Some 15 or so members of what I understand is Australia's National Socialist Network rocked up to the area where the Let Women Speak event plus the anti-women's rights counter-protest uh, were being held. And there were a few other events as well, apparently. And these guys did Nazi salutes. For the execrable, pea-brained, anti-women's rights activists, including the press and assorted politicians, that was good enough to pretend that Kelly J and every other woman there, including liberal politician Moira Deeming, were Nazis or Nazi sympathisers. Here is that loathsome anti-woman activist Pronoun Montgomery saying to me, why do the Nazis keep showing up to support you? Maybe stop sticking your head in the sand and think about it. Well, first of all, they don't. He is, of course, conflating Nazis with other far-right groups like Hearts of Oak and the Proud Boys. But how many events has Kelly J organised in this country and abroad? Dozens. And at how many of them, has there been even a whiff of any far-right people? They can be counted on one hand. There is no evidence whatsoever that they were invited or that Kelly J knew who they were when they filmed her or grabbed selfies with her. And I think in two or three cases they actually spoke, but they did not say anything remotely far-right. Never before has there been an organised and showy presence as there was in Melbourne. And anyone who thinks they were there to support those women is an idiot. They would have known their presence would be used against the turfs and they didn't care. The fact that they might agree, as most people do, that women don't have penises doesn't mean they support women's rights in any shape or form. Note, there were no women amongst them. Uh, notably, their presence did not distract the anti-women activists from their primary mission of attacking the women who say that men don't belong in women's spaces and transing kids is wrong, which in their eyes, of course, is the most abominable and outrageous transgression and every bit as bad as, if not worse than, murdering millions of people. <clears throat> but they have been weaponizing the neo-Nazi presence against Kelly J and all her supporters ever since. In the past few weeks, I have been called a Nazi sympathizer dozens of times, which is probably about a thousand times fewer than Kelly J has been called one. And it's ironic because from where I'm sitting, the Nazis appear to have far more in common with the anti-women protesters than we do. Both are violent and both are oppressive, while women fighting to hold on to our sex-based rights and protect children are neither. 
There is also this meme doing the rounds at the moment showing what Nazis and anti-women activists, or I should say other anti-women activists, have in common. They both sterilise children, are homophobic, sadistic doctors experiment on mentally ill patients, promote eugenics. I don't think I would agree with that one. But the rest of it seems pretty sound, are threatened by free speech, are really into flags, rely on government propaganda to enforce population-wide compliance with regressive ideology. Spot on. The neo-Nazis in Melbourne were there for their own purpose, to take advantage of the attention the women had garnered and grab some of that for themselves. To what extent they actually wanted to hurt Kelly J and the women speaking, I don't care to speculate. They carried a banner saying, destroy paedophile freaks, as if anyone would seriously disagree with the sentiments behind that, except pedos themselves, of course, and their sympathisers like that outspoken trans rights supporter Peter Tatchell. Kelly J and the organisers of the Melbourne meeting made it abundantly clear that the neo-Nazis had nothing to do with them. In a video they made afterwards talking about what had happened, they commented how odd it was that the police had kept the anti-women's activists at bay, but let the Nazis get as close as they did, although they weren't as close as some claimed. Kelly J denounced the Nazis and their beliefs. Did her doing so make any difference? No. Did it stop her detractors weaponising the presence of the Nazis against her? Of course not. Just as it wouldn't have made any difference if she'd denounced anyone who'd ever turned up to any of her events and filmed her or grabbed a selfie with her. I have tried to resist being drawn into the horrible and divisive fight started by feminists I respect and admire for many reasons, but I can't reconcile the attacks on Kelly J. Keane with feminism at any level. I think Graham Linehan nailed it in a recent episode of The Mess We're In. I'll link to that episode below, but here is a minute long clip. There are some people on our side who have consistently told lies about Posey, and they've consistently associated her with the right and uh, with fascists. And there is, as far as I can see, and I've been looking, you know, zero evidence for this beyond the kind of uh, excerpted things that you get from uh, trans rights activists. I'll give you an example. Uh, uh, people would send me Posey Parker's avatar that had the Barbie uh, dressed as, as a Nazi, so Nazi Barbie. She put that in her avatar as a joke because someone on our side called her that, you know? So so, so I just feel that I really wish that, that there's certain people who need to just kind of suck it up and say, you know what, fog of war, you know? Fog of war, I may have, I may have believed something that wasn't true. I may have passed on something that wasn't true. But it's, but it's shocking to me how, how far it got. As I say, she was nearly killed. And, and, you know, all she's ever done is put a microphone in front of women, you know? She's put a microphone in front of women, and no one remembers these women. These women, you know, they get terrified and beaten up, and, and, and all the chatter is about Posey, and all she does is stand up and fucking give them the microphone. It's disgraceful. Sorry. I'm also going to post below a link to Julianne Vigo's article entitled Anatomy of the Near Murder of Kelly J. Keane, because I agree with every word. Now, back to Melbourne. One woman made the mistake of posing in front of the Nazis and of course that was used against her and against the whole event saying she was basking in their support. And here she is pointing out that she was taking the piss. She did what I would probably have done myself when I was more naive. We just have to bear in mind that there is no cesspit too deep for these nutcases who are the biggest fascists alive. They will take anything they possibly can and try to use it to discredit us. Take Bully Bragg, for example, who referred to the Let Women Speak event as a Posey Parker Nazi rally and then isn't even big enough to own it in public. Stop calling women Nazis! 
I didn't call anybody a Nazi, madam. I simply pointed out that when Nazis turn up to support your cause, you might perhaps think which side you're on. Note that the one thing Bragg and every other anti-woman commenter won't do is engage seriously and in good faith with our argument that the word woman means adult human female, that sex is immutable, it matters, men don't belong in women's spaces and it's wrong to transition children because they are too young to understand the full implications of transitioning and give fully informed consent. These are not unreasonable positions and the anti-women activists know that which is why they focus so much time and energy into trying to suppress the voices of women and men who take these positions and misrepresent us. The media in Australia and New Zealand consistently called Kelly J an anti-trans activist instead of a women's rights activist, which is what inspired my decision to start using the term anti-women activist from now on. This is extreme gaslighting from ideologues who would insist that you refer to trans identifying people as they wish to be referred to, but who will not afford the same courtesy to anyone who disagrees, but they will reframe what we are for by interpreting it as being against other people, trying to put us on the defensive and, in the meantime, what gets lost? The fight to hang on to women's sex-based rights. That doesn't matter, it's only women's rights, okay? With the greatest of respect to all the speakers in every city, I watched you and you warmed my heart, you were brilliant, but I'm now going to focus on some of the negatives. First, the bewigged man in Melbourne who grabbed the mic out of a speaker's hand and screeched trans rights or something into it. Natalie Hudgens! You are the Minister for Women in Education! He probably felt like a great hero, but at the end of the day, what did he do but show himself to be a thuggish bully who will shout over women talking about women's rights, but has nothing to give except an empty slogan. He is a symbol of anti-women activism and of the gender identity cult. Now, years ago, I watched an Australian politician called Pauline Hanson on an Australian reality TV show. It was The Celebrity Apprentice. I have no recollection as to what she was like or if I liked her or not. I had to read up on her while seeing her speak at the Canberra event because she looked familiar. And it turns out she's a right wing politician, so I wouldn't vote for her. But I profoundly disagree with the Scottish Labour Party's Lachlan Stewart, who intimated that she shouldn't have been allowed to speak. Why not? She's a woman. And the event was called Let Women Speak. Now, she could have got up there and made some anti-immigration speech or whatever it is she stands for, but she didn't. I suspect that if she had, it wouldn't have gone down well. She spoke about women's rights and the likes of Lachlan Stewart are not doing the left any favours when they advocate no platforming a democratically elected politician in 2023. You don't win debates by not letting people express their views and you don't get a chance to counter them. Talking of which, first, I'm going to give respect to this woman also in Canberra who waited her turn and up to a point she made a good speech, well prepared, packed with information. But she illustrates what you sound like when you think men can be a kind of woman and vice versa and how it distorts your thinking. First, she claimed that trans identifying people don't get the same respect as other people from medical professionals, even for the smallest of ailments. In a country where transgenderism appears to be revered, that really doesn't ring true and a lot of people called her a liar. Then she made the mistake of telling an anecdote about a female trans identifying friend she had who died because she couldn't get checked for HPV. Women, 
Okay, I have a friend. I had a friend. They've now passed away. They were a trans man, and when they went to the doctor, they couldn't get checked for HPV. They wouldn't check them because they didn't think that they were... Right. What happens when you demand that people believe the lies that they are told? That doctor won't be able to treat your friend who was a woman for female, for female health conditions because on those notes it said she was a man. Do you not understand this? Kelly J lost her rag a bit with this one, which I can sympathise with, though I wonder if it wouldn't have been better to just let the woman finish her speech and then make the same obvious points about what can happen when you are recorded as the wrong sex. Instead of interrupting her, the woman ended on a predictable note. You're all spreading hate and it's stupid. Thank you very much without a trace of irony. Now, Lydia Thorpe, independent politician and senator for Victoria. This hapless, attention-seeking idiot decided to make a degrading spectacle of herself with a personal publicity stunt, and I understand this is in keeping with her public persona generally. Here, we see her mincing up to Kelly J. She was reportedly in high heels. She's holding up a flag while Kelly J is speaking and she is shouting, you're not welcome here, as if this would be news to Kelly J. Stunning revelation. The truth is that some, at least those who attended her events, welcomed her and many others who turned up to protest women's rights didn't. But she was there perfectly legally, so on what authority does this woman suggest otherwise? And what purpose did her behaviour serve? How much more effective would her intervention have been had she waited her turn to speak and then made a rousing speech telling the truth about why pervy men who say they're women should be accepted as such and allowed into our changing rooms and why children who wish they were born the other sex should be put on puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones which will make them infertile etc. She had a brilliant opportunity to do that but instead she behaved like a schoolyard bully. I've slowed this clip down. As you can see, she struggles frantically to get away from the security man. The woman in red seems to be trying to help restrain her, and then a police officer grabs her from behind and whisks her away from the security man, and she completely flops and ends up on the ground. That reminds me of a parent whisking away their toddler from trouble of some sort. She claimed she was pulverised by police. Seriously? A lot of people actually claim she was assaulted. I see no evidence of an assault, just people doing their job and protecting her target from her rage. What did they expect the security and police to do? Just let her have at it? She damn well knew exactly what was going to happen. And then, instead of letting the police help her up, she crawls away on all fours. Excuse excruciating. How is this woman her senator? Tatum Steele was one of the organisers of the Canberra event and she wrote a piece for The Spectator entitled Did the Federal Government Refuse to Protect Women? Of the media coverage she writes that she noticed curious omissions from the media's reporting of these events. First, most reports have ignored our account of the gross verbal abuse, sexual harassment and threats of violence we were subjected to by counter-protesters. The counter-protesters, predominantly young men and students from my own university, came with a clear purpose to make as much noise as possible to drown out the voices of women speaking. Among the vitriolic chants screamed at us were such absurdities as F off fascists and go home Nazis. 
One of the counter-protesters, a strongly built man wearing a grey tracksuit, was filmed making kissing lips at the female marshals, his erection clearly visible through his pants. I was verbally abused by another young man screaming... I can't read this out. I'll link uh, below. But those are the people, female politicians like Lydia Thorpe and Cassie O'Connor are in bed with. I'm not even going to bother talking about the male politicians because they don't particularly surprise me after what we've experienced in the UK. It's the women who support the women haters who really disgust me. OK, I've already shown some of the headlines. In fact, it got even worse than that. And we believe that by Minister Wood not acting to bar Posey Parker from the, uh, from the country, that he was acting unreasonably. Uh, and that, that's the case that we've put forward for judicial review. We believe that there's quite a case based on what we've seen um, in Melbourne in terms of the neo-Nazis showing up in support of her rally, um, but also the general anti-trans hatred uh, that she is spreading, um, that there are grounds for risk of public order. And uh, so we've asked for that to be reviewed and in an interim order in place to stop her from entering the country today. Is there an evidence of that? Because there's obviously, uh, the, the hate is one thing and mm. there's, no doubt, there's no doubt of the hatred that she has for the trans community. Blatant evil lie here blew me away. Where is the evidence of this hatred of the trans community or that her mere presence and what she says endangers trans people? How can they say this stuff and make no attempt to justify it? What will it take to get into their stupid heads that she's not interested in the trans Borg? None of us are. Our concern is with men getting into women's spaces, sports and occupations and children being misled into believing they can be what they are not and deceived into becoming permanently dependent on risky cross-sex hormones. Obviously, we are anti-gender ideology, but that is not clear from the term anti-trans. Finally, New Zealand. First, I'm going to show a few seconds of Karen. You're kidding, right? Davis from her Substack. She mentioned that the Prime Minister of New Zealand wanted to keep her out of the country, but it was determined that she did not actually pose a threat to anyone in New Zealand, and so she was allowed to enter. So what the hell is this? I'll tell you what it is. It's a call to members of the trans community to make it necessary for there to be an obituary for Kelly J. Keene. This is an invitation to murder. Obviously, I'll give the link to that below so you can watch the whole thing. Now I'm going to read the tweeted statement from the group of Maori women, Mana Oahine Carrero. Morena, we'd like to thank everyone for their outpouring of support and aroha in light of the horrendous TRA violence displayed for all the world to see at the Let Women Speak event in Oakland on Saturday. MWK collaborated with other women to organise the New Zealand events and we spent hours and hours of time, energy and money attempting to ensure the safety of women was upheld by respective councils and by police. As we all know now, we were sold out. We are constantly amazed that such a so-called minority group has the power and influence to impact the behaviour of media, certain elected officials, councils and police in an effort to violently quell our voices. After Kelly J was safely exited from the violent scenes on Saturday, supporters were left to fend for themselves from the unhinged baying lynch mob, thanks in great part to police inaction and disinterest. Women, elderly, were chased up the street. One was punched more than once in the face. We believe another didn't even make it to the event before she was punched in the face, having to go to hospital. Another woman has a broken foot. Women were spat on, had produced projectiles thrown at them, were kicked, grabbed at by the hair, clothing, legs, arms, pulled to the ground in an effort to be trampled on. The scenes have been described by attendees as zombie apocalyptic. 
that the media has decided to gloss over the reality of these traumatic experiences is no surprise. We know this is their standard. We have been asked by media for an interview, but given their lack of honesty and integrity, we turned it down. Despite the orchestrated manner in which these events were shut down, we will not be deterred. We thank the Posey Parker for ripping the scab off for the whole world to see. We are so proud of our Wahine Toa and what they were forced to endure on Saturday. This is not the end. Kia ora. I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce those Maori words properly. And now I'm going to show some of the footage of the Auckland event. It starts with Kelly J's own footage and then I use other people's links to the originals it will be below. That is what a hate crime looks like. When I first watched Kelly J's own live footage, it left me feeling sick, close to tears, and trembling with rage. And I still feel the rage. That is not going anywhere. I didn't have the words to describe those savages, but Brendan O'Neill nails it. I think, you know, what we saw on, on, on Saturday in, in Auckland let's be brutal about it, this was a deranged mob. This was a, a feral mob of misogynists who were uh, screaming at a woman, screaming expletives at her, throwing things in her face, throwing placards and water and soup. And in my spectator piece, I likened it to a witch trial of the 1500s. That's the real atmosphere that, that one could feel from that event in Auckland, and it was pretty shocking. So I think a lot of people are now looking at New Zealand and thinking to themselves, how has New Zealand arrived at a situation where such a disgusting mob attack can take place against a woman who simply wanted to stand in a public place and say that a woman is an adult human female? A witch trial, it was a mob, it was a gathering of deranged people who were acting in concert to try and prevent a woman from expressing herself freely in, pub in public. They are so stupid. Do they really think they've achieved something good with this? Well, they have. They have made Kelly J look stronger and braver than ever. She is, as a result of what they did, more admired than ever. Anyway, before I get carried away in a full-blown rant, let's see what happened to Emily. Um, this is a very poor quality video, I'm afraid. I will highlight the people to watch. First, this individual, who I suspect from the physique is male, but I can't be sure, in a black cropped top, pushing down the fence. Oh, it looks like a Nike top. It's not Dylan Mulvaney, is it? Now we see them pulling up the pegs that are holding up a line. There's Emily with the blue arrow on her who turns and sees what's happening. Others are charging through the now open barrier. See this guy holding up the placard? This is him. His sign says 
Go home, Posey. Take a good look. It really is a poor quality film, isn't it? But there he is, and there is Emily. She appears to be talking now at the person in the uh, Nike top, and she seems to shove them with her right arm. And seeing this, the placard man charges towards her and first headbutts her. Do I detect a smile on Nike person's face? Not sure. Then it's punch, punch, punch three times. Want to see that again, zoomed in? And again. One final thing to show you um, is this piece from Radio New Zealand's website. Police urge anyone, including the rainbow community, to report threats, violence. Analysts monitoring online extremism say since Kelly J. Keane Mitchell, known as Posey Parker, came to Aotearoa, there has been a marked increase in online hatred directed at the trans community here. Well done. I'm sure, at least I hope, that maybe that's a false hope nowadays, but I still hope that some of those members of the so-called trans community were just people wanting to quietly live their lives without hurting anyone, and you have helped to make their lives just that little bit worse now. When Radio New Zealand tweeted a link to this piece, there was such a backlash that they deleted the tweet. What do you expect, you anti-women activists? You reap what you sow. New Zealand, which was the first country to give women the vote, is now the worst country for women that Kelly J says she has been to. And after watching those scenes or hearing what happened, who wouldn't believe her? New Zealand would seem to be lost. Australia would seem to be lost but they're not. They're not lost. And the reason they're not lost is because no ideology that is based on lies and which depends on brutality, telling nasty, vicious falsehoods about people, trying to prevent people from being heard, trying to get their books banned, trying to get them fired from their jobs, trying in general to destroy people's livelihoods and even their lives, an ideology like that, rather than one based on reason and evidence and humanity, it's not sustainable in the long term. So many people who were once upon a time on the wrong side of this war have had their eyes opened and they've come over. The worrying question is how many more people have to get their bones broken? Is it going to take a murder, several murders, before those who hold the real power come to their senses? Never forget, this is a top-down movement. This is not a human rights movement. It is an anti-women's rights movement. And we are half the population, but we each of us need to step up and do what we can to resist. And I know I am speaking from the dubious privilege of someone who has almost nothing left that I can lose fighting this. I'm not suggesting people put themselves in danger, sacrifice their livelihoods and all their relationships with others, although I'd say some relationships possibly aren't worth hanging on to. But I'm saying think of what you might be able to do, whether it's sharing information, even anonymously on social media, donating financially to those who are fighting, especially the legal battles, attending events and protests, writing to your MPs, your politicians, voting for candidates on our side, spoiling your ballot with appropriate messages when there is nobody you feel you can vote for, complaining to institutions that are pushing this ideology and anything else you can think of. Share your ideas. We will win. That's all. Bye for now.